Joining me right now, columnist, political analyst, Carrie Elleveld of Daily Coast. We have so much uh, to talk about that she's been covering and writing about. Welcome back to the program, Carrie. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. Always good to be here. Uh, I was just talking about the digital ads that Democrats are running, uh, responding to the Democratic National Committee, Rick Scott's uh, Rescue America platform, the 11-point plan, which is all about raising taxes on millions of Americans. And it's great to see the DNC doing uh, these ads. Uh, as we're coming to tax time, they're actually digital ads for people who are searching online trying to do their last minute, uh, you know, tax preparation. They, they direct them to this website. <laughs> that's great. I did not realize that's where they were popping up. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's called, and it's GOPtaxhike.com. Talk, talk a little bit about the plan, because you've dug into it, and, and we've been talking about it, how it would raise taxes on roughly 100 million low- and moderate-income Americans. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's not just tens of millions. It's like a hundred million, you know, that's like, I mean, you know, Rick Scott, of course, laid this out much to the, to the chagrin of, of minor, GOP minority leader Mitch McConnell, who, who was very happily and smugly, you know, saying, I'm not going to let anyone know what we're going to do. We'll decide when we, you know, we'll let you know when we get the majority. I mean, he, he just didn't want to put anything out there. So then Rick Scott, who, who, you know, is kind of trying to position himself, I and mean, this is part of the problem the GOP has right now, is that no, no one leader is particular. no one believes that they're, I mean, by far the most popular person, don't get me wrong, right now in the Republican Party is still Donald Trump. That's still true, <laughs> right. right? But everybody's like, gee, is he really going to run or might, you know, might some horrible thing, you know, get, you know, block him from being able to do that. So everybody's sort of still positioning themselves to have opportunities. And Rick Scott has always wanted to run, you know, uh, for, for president. I mean, he sees himself in that light. Um, his, you know, was sort of an, he has sort of an alienist quality, I guess he would bring to the White House. But anyway, <laughs> um, he, but, and it, you know, he's got some very strange hand gestures. He's got that very, you know, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of really attractive bald men out there, but he just got, he just looks. <laughs> he's very odd. I, I, I shouldn't yes. even go into it. He's odd. He's odd. He, there's something that's kind of odd and unrelatable about him. So anyway, it, you know, I, sh I should not be bringing those up. If, if someone was bringing qualities like that up about a woman, I would say that's sexism. So, you know, shame on me. But in any case, uh, I digress. The point <laughs> is, okay. is that Rick Rick Scott has ambitions, and they are presidential in nature. But if uh, he cannot run for president because Donald Trump, you know, runs is still sort of uh, running the line there, then, you know, he, he, he hasn't ruled out trying to oust McConnell. And McConnell still, ha you know, McConnell has held on to that job partly because the big right wingers in the caucus, uh, like Josh Hawley, like Ted Cruz, are just enormously unpopular. Nobody likes them. You know, I mean, wasn't it Lindsey Graham who famously said that, that someone could murder uh, Ted Cruz on the Senate floor and no one would say anything? <laughs> I don't know, something horrible like that. So in any case, he, he's not a very, po you know, he doesn't have any, any sort of popular people trying to oust him. You know, Rick Scott, I think, in order to position himself for a future president, pre presidential run, wouldn't mind having... Uh, Mitch McConnell's, you know, ties, his developing his uh, fundraising network, whatever. So he comes out with this plan. And it and one of the things in it, one of the little nuggets of this 11 point plan is everybody, every American needs to have skin in the game. And what he's what he's saying is everyone needs to pay taxes, no matter how disadvantaged they are, no matter how little means they have or whatever. And he's basically talking about raising tax, taxes on, you know, uh, he's, he wants to raise about a trillion dollar in re dollars in revenue over a decade and do it on the backs of working and middle class Americans, mm -hmm. basically so that the wealthy corporations and individuals in, in America can continue to keep the tax cut that the GOP, right. the super unpopular tax cut that the GOP pushed through in 2017. So, I mean, this is just like... And, and I you mean, know, I, 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 and, and I got to say, even McConnell's response to it, it, it had a bit of like, don't say the quiet part out loud, you know, quality to it, because he said 
we are not going to raise taxes on over half of Americans, and we're not going to sunset Social Security in five years. They both had this, like, last phrase that was like, okay, maybe it's slightly less than half America of Americans. Maybe it's sunsetting Social Security in eight years, right? Like, <laughs> we're going right, exactly. to sun, sunset it in eight years. And by the way, we're only raising taxes on 49% of Americans, right, not half. Right. So there. So, I mean, but yeah, exactly. And the, and the other point is, it's like, I, I think, you know, the, a lot of people are like, this is Rick Scott's plan. As far as I'm concerned, it's the only GOP plan out there right now, you know, right. For, for the Senate, for Senate Republicans. McConnell has failed to articulate anything. And what Rick Scott did was, you know, uh, step into that vacuum and offer up his vision. It may be horrible. It may be politically terrible for them, which I certainly hope it is. I mean, I hope this sinks in for Americans because it's not clear to me, even though Mitch, McCon Mitch McConnell has for, you know, a handful of years now, a little over, been losing, steadily losing ground, of, you know, as sort of the standard bearer of this old guard Republican uh, wing of the party, right? And it's it's more Trumpy now than it ever was, even when Trumpy, even when Trump was pre was was president. So you know, he he just continues to lose ground. I I don't put it past Rick Scott to be able to pull off pull that off. Yeah. Oh, if and, Trump runs you know, again. And yeah. when you when you say I hope Americans you know really grab onto this, I mean I'm glad to see the DNC doing these ads. But this should be, yeah. I mean, like so many other issues, this should be front and center coming out of every Democrat's mouth. There should be other ads everywhere. I mean, and and it, the polling on this, uh, it, it's like another disaster for Republicans if Americans know about the disaster. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's not popular with anyone. It's 16 points. If I remember, there's been several polls out. And, you know, it, it, it bombed with like two thirds of the American people and sometimes more. It, one, one poll had about two thirds and another poll had a little bit above that. So I think even in the 70th, 70th percentile um, by reputable organizations. Right. This is these aren't just like random, you know, X polls on the Internet or whatever. It's by uh, one of them was by Navigator Research, which is a consortium of consortium of progressive pollsters who come together to do this messaging stuff. And, uh, and so, you know, it's very clearly unpopular, but in one of those polls, and I think it was Navigator, it was even 16 points underwater with Republicans. So, you know, I mean, no one really is like, yeah, let's, let's tax, tax the little guys because they're not paying their fair share. Um, and, you know, it's even seeping down into some of these, uh, in, into some of, some of the, um, uh, races that are going out in uh, in the states, right, going on in the states right now. So you know, in Ohio, one guy last fall went on. He was a he's running for the open Senate seat in Ohio, um, and he he told Crane's Business Journal that middle the middle class, any way you slice it, you know, when you look at o overall how many what American Amer what portion of their you know. Um, of their income Americans are paying taxes on that the middle class wasn't paying its fair share. All right, yeah, Mike, Mike uh, Gibbons. I actually played the clip Gibbons. earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so, I mean, th the thing is, is that with absent Rick Scott's, you know, 11 point platform for what, you know, agenda for what Republicans would do, um, which is really quite awful. I mean, it's a dysto dystopian hellscape that he's talking about there. There's other things in it, but, um, in any case, if he hadn't put that out, I think that Gibbons comment just kind of goes away. It doesn't get noticed. It happened last fall anyways. It may have been seen as a singular gaff, but it wouldn't be brought up as, hey, did you, did you really mean this? And do you support raising taxes on the middle class? Because, you know, the Senate GOP campaign chief does. And so what you're saying sort of jives with, you know, in mirrors what Rick Scott is saying. And without that, without, you know, Scott putting that out, I don't think that resonates the same way. It's a singular gap, but not necessarily an overarching, right. you know, theme of what Republicans might do. Right. Now, you've also been looking at polling 
uh, regarding President Biden and uh, certainly looking at the civics poll and his numbers, obviously, over uh, a period of months have gone down. But you're seeing that he could be getting some pickup from Americans around the handling of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And yesterday, uh, the president uh, in Iowa suggested that uh, Putin was carrying out a genocide uh, against the Ukrainian people. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously, President Zelensky responding, calling him a true leader and, and how that's rubbing off and, and could help him. Yeah, I mean, I just really think overall, and I, I do not want, you know, I mean, none of us, and including you and including any of, you know, all of your listeners, no one wants to trivialize what, you know, the brutality, the, the genocide, the horrific things we are seeing in Ukraine, um, you know, and trivialize it by just talking about, you know, politics here in America. But it, but it does matter. And I always say, you know, the Ukrainians have to win their fight for democracy. We have to fin- win our fight for democracy. We have to win here, there and everywhere. And so this is a piece of, of you know, of protecting our democracy is having a president who is handling um, this very delicate situation and, you know, a horrible situation, a tragic, uh, you know, set of circumstances um, competently. And, you know, I, I'm, I've looked at both the polling. I mean, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to paint a bright and shiny picture about where uh, Biden's approval numbers are right now. They're still not high. There's still a ton of people who think the you know, country is headed in the wrong direction. But on the issue of Ukraine, I really do think he's gained credibility here. It doesn't hurt to have someone who has become an international hero um, call him, a, you know, a, a true leader uh, today or yesterday. I guess probably uh, uh, President Zelensky did that yesterday. Uh, but the time changes throw me off a little bit sometimes. But anyway, um, but the point is, is that, uh, you know, I, I look at the polling and also have been have kind of become addicted to um, a podcast called uh, The Focus Group with Sarah Longwell. Okay, She's a never Trumper Republican who I actually knew quite well in D.C. when I lived there. Um, and and uh, she is publisher of The Bulwark. So she decided, she for years right. she did focus groups, and now she decided, let's just put them on air. People can hear for themselves what, the, you know, what, what they're telling us. And so if you combine a little bit sort of the numbers that you're seeing in the polling plus why people are thinking these things in the, you know, in the focus groups, you get a sense. And it's clear that, there's, that, that this is doing two things um, for uh, Biden. Um, Number one, you know, it's reminding Democrats why it's so important and why they voted for this guy, Um, you know, because he he can handle an international affair like this that has so many consequences and it could have consequences for generations. Um, But it's also, you know, you hear in these in these uh, focus groups. These Trump Biden voters, right? The voters who voted for Trump in 2016 and voted for Biden in 2020, and this really reaffirms um, for them why they voted for Biden, right? They're mm. disgusted by President, by sorry, former former uh, for, by Donald Trump. I hate to call him POTUS anyway, but <laughs> and, and, um, and then they couldn't uh, imagine where we'd be right now in the world yeah, if Trump exactly, were president. Exactly, they're disgusted. They can't believe that. that uh, you know, they can believe, but they hate the fact that Trump is out there calling Putin a genius. Right. And then but then, you know, Biden is really gaining credibility and reminding them, oh, yeah, this is why I voted for this guy, because Trump would have just been horrific in this situation. Right. So it's really clear to me that this this and I think when he gets you know, a second, you know, last week or whatever, uh, Biden said that thing where, good God, this, you know, this man Putin cannot remain in power, right? And the media went crazy and said, this is a huge gaffe and whatever. Now, I, I'm not speaking about what it me- meant internationally. Here at home, I think that that, that particular uh, phrase played fine because it captured the American psyche about what mm-hmm. they're seeing and the butchery of Putin. And, and, and polling came out showing that two thirds of the country, roughly two thirds of the country agreed with Biden on that. 
um, that that he, that he can't remain in power. Um, and then, you know, and this, it's always just roughly two thirds, but that's really right where it sits. That's like these are, you know, these are reality based Americans assessing what's going on and saying, yeah, I kind of agree with that statement. True as it is, you know. And then and then the same thing with Biden, you know, kind of getting ahead of the international lawyers declaring this a genocide and saying, look, he's trying to wipe them out over there. He's trying to wipe out what it means to, to even be a Ukrainian. Like it's a genocide to me. You know, that that is both shaping what Americans uh, it's both helping to shape how Americans view the war in Ukraine, but it's also it's also reflecting the American psyche. Um, you know, I think he's just in, in those moments, he's sometimes his best where he's just sort of like empathically saying what he sees and saying what he thinks. And it's very reflective of what most of the country is seeing, too. Yeah, it'll be interesting uh, seeing how how this moves forward, of course, um, as this war, which nobody knows where it's going, uh, continues. Uh, it, it's so great to have you on to talk about these issues, Carrie. It goes so quick. Uh, so, so we'll have to pick it up. I had a whole bunch of other things I wanted to get into, but we'll have to pick it up again. Sorry. So thank, thanks so much yeah. for coming on today. Well, thank oh, and, you to you. No, and, no and apologies, and please. No apologies. It was. It's always great uh, hearing from you. Uh, so thanks for coming on. Uh, Carrie Elleveld, folks, uh, make sure to follow her on Twitter at Carrie Elleveld, E-L-E-V-E-L-D, at Daily Coast. We're back in a couple of minutes. This is the Michelangelo Signorelli Show, Sirius XM. 